Hooray. Welcome to the Gathering Church. My name is John Mark Redwine. I'm the lead pastor, and it's so good to have you guys with us here today. Happy summer. It is summer at the Gathering. We're excited for summer. I mean, we, we, one of my favorite things uh, about summer is everything in that video, man. This is a great place to live in the summertime, and, and so we're celebrating that over the next few weeks. We got snow cones outside today after service. Go grab you a snow cone and... Uh, and over the next few weeks, as we get into Summer at the Gathering, what we like to do is a series called Summer at the Gathering, which is our opportunity each year, instead of having an interconnected series that span a few weeks, over the next seven weeks, um, really we're just going to kind of share our heart with you. There's a, there's a few messages uh, that I've kind of had cooking for a long time that I'm excited to share with you and, and just to um, take, take a few weeks to kind of step out of that normal rhythm and and into summer. So if it's your first time with us here, welcome. We're just so honored to have you. We're so glad that you're here. We've got a sign over this auditorium door that says, Welcome Home. But I hope you didn't just read Welcome Home on a sign this morning. I hope somebody made you feel welcome home because this is a family. And uh, at the gathering, man, we, we just want to be a family where you can come and join arms with people down a simple spiritual pathway that you might be able to know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and make a difference. And so, man, we're just so glad to have you. If it's your first time, when you came in today, you were given a program, and inside that program is a Connect card. And if you fill out a little bit of information on that card and turn it in at our information center, we've got a free gift just to thank you for being here today. That is just for you. We just love to say hi to you, to get to know you a little bit today. And so... Uh, if you would do that, that would help us. Today is step two of Growth Track, and that's happening right now. Let me tell you a little bit about Growth Track if you don't know uh, or if you're new to the church. We are so proud of our dream team at the Gathering Church. See, we believe that ministry is not to be done by a handful of ministers who are full-time and removed from the rest of the people. We believe the ministry of the church is done by the church together, that we all have a gift, that we all have a purpose, and we link arms in those purposes using the gifts God's given us to serve our city and to see lives changed. And that's what our dream team is doing all the time, all throughout the week, every Sunday. And so uh, the growth track is your entrance into the dream team. If you've been a part of our church for a while and haven't stepped into that team yet or aren't really sure what area you could be a part of, going to growth track isn't a commitment. It, it, it is an exploration. It is our way of helping you discover your purpose. So not next week, but the first Sunday in July, we will have growth track step one. It happens at 11 a.m. during this service right out there. Man, we would love to host you. You'll find out a little bit more about our church and how we got here, and, and then we'll talk about you, everybody's favorite subject. So let me invite you to come back for growth track that first weekend of July. Well, 
Today, as we start our Summer at the Gathering series, I want to talk to you about something that's kind of been cooking in me for about the last year. If you've been uh, attending our church for the last six or seven months, um, somebody brought up to me a couple weeks ago that in the conclusion of almost every message, when I get to the application, that I'm telling people that the way to get past whatever season you're in or to apply what this, this principle is to your life is to worship God more closely. That, that has been a common thread in my teaching because that has been what God has been teaching me over the last year. Let me just kind of share with you where I'm coming from. So every year in January and August, our church does a season of prayer called 21 Days of Prayer. In January, we fast and pray, and in August, we feast and pray. Come on, somebody. Just saying. There's no feast. There's no feast. There's just you eat like a normal, like you would normally eat. Let me move on from this. And uh, these seasons of prayer have become one of my favorite times in the church. And this, this past August was our first time doing it, starting this rhythm. And I, I'll tell you that for me, um, I've been a Christian 10 years last March. And for me, my time with God had always been consistent, but had been hot and cold. I mean, and I had, I had a structure. I'm, once I build a routine, I'm pretty good at following it. In fact, I'm pretty hard to knock off routine. But I, I had a system of getting into a devotion with God, a daily devotion with God, that had been the same since I became a Christian. And it shifted for August for the 21 days of prayer. During that time, I would get up a little bit earlier, and I'd go down in our basement. I'd spend about 20 minutes just in worship. I have built a playlist of some of my favorite worship songs. I think there's kind of two styles of music we listen to in that category. There's praise and worship. And praise is more like singing about what God's done in our life and, and honor and talking about how good he is. It's kind of, it's, it goes this way. It's kind of, we're together celebrating how good he is. And then there's worship. And worship is just about God. It's not about me. It's not about, it's not about what I want or what I'm asking. It's just, it's me and God. And so there's these two styles, and I built this playlist. It was like two songs of praise and then a bunch of songs of worship. And for 20 minutes there during that 21 days, that's what I was doing. Now, up until that point, I just believed that the way a devotion or a quiet time worked is that sometimes I would read the scripture and it would feel like God was in the room speaking to me, like the passage was for me, like that had been written, like, like he knew I was going to read that passage that day and it was going to speak to me. And, and other times, and my prayers would feel like I was having a conversation with somebody in the room, but then maybe about 65% of the time. It was, it was more like reading a book that I didn't really understand. Even after all this time after school, it was still, it was still like reading to study something, like a textbook. And, and when I would pray, it felt a little bit like when my daughter pretends to be on the phone, and she'll just carry a phone around and just have these long conversations, and you and I both know no one is on the other end of that phone, and how is she even doing that, you know? And honestly, sometimes, or a lot of times, that's what my prayer felt like. It felt like one-sided and you know, I always knew God would show up and, and that if I leaned in and I was consistent, that I would have seasons where, where I could feel his presence. But something shifted last year. And last August, I introduced worship. and It had never been a part of my time, my devotion time, my prayer time, my time with God. It was something I did on Sundays. I would, I would put a worship playlist on from time to time, mostly right, right before life group so the people coming in would know, hey, this is, this is a, I listen to this all the time, you guys. Other than that, it was a lot of Johnny Cash and George Strait, if I'm being honest, if I was listening to music. And that shifted. So last August, I, I put an intentional season of worship together for myself and experienced more intimacy with God than I ever have in my life. And so I got to the other side of that and I thought, well, let me just, let's, let's just see if this keeps moving. You know, maybe it's kind of a 21 days of prayer thing. Let's, let's see if God keeps showing up in this way. And I've made that a part of my practice for almost the last year. And I can tell you that that intimacy with God hasn't shifted. It hasn't changed. There's, it's not hot and cold. It's not in and out. I believe that he's attracted to worship, that his presence is attracted to it. And for me, in my life, by making that a, a more important part of my life, I've been felt more connected to God than I ever have in my entire life before. So today's message is, is maybe a little bit different, because really, th this is something that's helped me out a lot uh, this past year. There's been some really hard moments for me in this past year. 
And this has, has changed it. It's, it's changed every season and every scenario. And so my hope is that it, since this has helped me so much, has changed me so much, I just want to give it to you. And so I just want to take something that's working for me, and I want to give it to you, take it or leave it. That's up to you. I've, I've been searching Scripture to try and understand more about this, and I believe this is God's design for us. It's what He wants for us. And so my hope is, if you're in here today, and worship has always kind of just been a part of a ritual for you, or a, or, or a part of something that you do, you know, that you go in on Sundays, and they're playing music, and you know, this is great. These guys are, are music. This is, they can play. That guy can really strum a guitar. This is great. And, and you just listen to the music and it's been a part of your habit, or maybe, maybe it's never been a part of your, your daily habit, you know, the way that you get in and intimate with God, or maybe even you're in here today and you've always struggled with feeling intimate with God, that, that you've heard the pastor say over and over, if you want to grow closer to him, you got to be in his presence and, and you need to be studying scripture every day and praying every day. And that's always been a hard habit for you to build because it felt so difficult. I just think worship is the key. And so I want to share with you something that has changed me today, and I believe if you will take it and apply it and give it some time and learn it and lean into it, that this can change you as well. So I want to share with you this morning a few different ways, um, a, cu a couple different thoughts, different ideas that I had about why worship is important, and honestly, why we worship the way that we do here. If I could, if I could even just defend the way for a moment that we worship the way we do here at the gathering, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, and God bless them, great people. But you know, I, I, and thank God for them. But the way that we worshipped in that tradition uh, was 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 a very it was a very solemn, still stance, and it was an organ, and it and it was the slowest songs in the hymnal, first, second, fourth verse, never the third. You know, I don't know, I don't know what the deal was with that third verse. We never touched it. It was just first, second, fourth. When I was in middle school, we hired a guy named Moses, and his, he, we called him Mix Master Moses because he, he liked to bring some contemporary uh, uh, choruses into the hymns occasionally, and that was a big controversy. And the way that, uh, that we would worship primarily growing up was, was, you know, kind of the Baptist step, you know, one of these, a little bit, very, you know, you get into the gospel songs, you get a little bit heavy sometimes, and it's a little bit of that. And, and, and so, you know, maybe you're, you're like me, and that's kind of that's where you've come from, and that's what you're used to, and, and in, in this place, it gets, a little bit more, it gets a little bit more intense, you know, sometimes, I've heard people shout at times, which can be a little unsettling, you know, to me and my Baptist friends, you know, it's like, wait, what was that? We, we like to raise hands and move around. I've even seen a guy doing the Pentecostal step, which is a lot more, it's a lot more intense, than the Baptist step, you know, and, and so I, I just want to talk to you for a minute about why we worship the way that we do and why I think that this worship is so important in our lives. A few different thoughts. First thing is that I, I believe worship matters so much because God asks us for it. He asks us for it. And, and really, the, the message could be one point. It, I, I, could, I could build a defense on why worship and praise in song is so important simply because God asks us for our praises and for our worship. The way that, that we worship matters to him. I love there's a psalm. So David writes a lot about worship in his psalms. He's writing all these songs that, that get sung and, and that they're using in, in, in synagogues and in the temple and in the church for, for praise. And the tabernacles are filled with these beautiful words. And one of the, one of the later, the, the Psalm 150, this is it. This is, the, this is the closing ceremonies. David does this, this great psalm. It goes like this. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. David has understood that God has asked him for praise. And so just in a refrain over and over again through the Psalms, he says, praise the Lord. And in this one, he just, he just reminds us, oh, praise God. Praise him above, praise him below. Praise him for everything he's done. Praise him for who he is. And then he gets specific in the how. He says, praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. How many of you guys missed that early 90s worship? Celebrate Jesus, celebrate. Da -na -na -da -na 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 -na. The trumpet, no, never mind. We won't be doing it here. Pray, praise him with the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Stringed instruments in the church. Lord, help us. Praise him with the timbrel and with dancing. 
Praise him with the clash of cymbals. I'm just saying, you got to bring some percussion into the church sometimes. And don't just bring the percussion in, let it resound. It says, with the, let, it says, praise him with resounding cymbals. Don't just play those drums, play them loud. Get in there. Praise him, praise him. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath, in case you missed it, one more time, praise the Lord. The word here for praise at the very last sentence is hallel, which is a Hebrew word, which when you look at the the definition of it, I think it describes the way that we're meant to worship, the way that David worshiped, that he exhibited, that he wrote about, that he lived. It says this in the lexicon, which is kind of the dictionary of Hebrew words. Hallel, to shine, hence to make a show, to boast, and thus be clamorously foolish, to rave causatively, to celebrate. David understood this so well. There's a a, a story in scripture where the Ark of the Covenant is coming back into the holy city. And David is so excited to have the presence of God in the city of God that it says he begins dancing half naked in the streets, dancing all around the king of Israel, dancing all around this thing. And somebody's like, one of the church people's like, hey, you need to say to us, you need to get this man in line. He is, he's all this dancing and foolishness needs to stop and David responds, no, I'll become even more undignified than this in praising the Lord my God. We've just got to know that God asks us for our worship, and he doesn't ask us for worship that is quiet and still. He doesn't, that's all good, but God asks us to give it everything we've got, to put our hearts in worship in a way that is fresh and new. Because praise is my purpose. I think worship matters so much because we were made to worship. It's part of our purpose. It's, it's part of our design, you know. I, I, worship is more than song and singing. In fact, it, I believe that our lives should reflect worship, that when we're living in our purpose, I think, I think it honors God and it glorifies God. I believe he put a purpose in each and every one of us, dreams in our hearts, a passion inside of you, gifts that he's given you that perfectly connect to the gifts that his Holy Spirit comes alongside and gives you as well. And, And that I I believe that when you're living in that purpose, it is an act of worship to God. But I also believe that to actually worship, to sing his worship, to sing his praises, is a part of the reason that we are created. It's a part of why we exist on this earth. 1 Peter 2.9 says, You are a chosen people, chosen, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. If the devil's been lying to you about your value and your worth, you need to remember that this is what God thinks about you. It says, you are a chosen people that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You are chosen, you're set aside for a reason, for a purpose, and it is to declare the praises of the one who has called you out of the darkness and into his lights. Praise is your purpose. You are chosen and called to declare his praises. Listen, I gotta tell you this morning, all that we do here Sunday mornings, this, it's not just for you. I think we get it in our heads sometimes that, that church is for us. We think, well, I hope they're playing the, the playlist that I want this morning. I hope they play some of my favorite songs. I hope that, I hope that the message is, is for me today. I hope that, that everything looks good and it, it's the way I want it. And we kind of get in this mindset. We'll, we'll shift around. We'll get uncomfortable because we think this is something that's for me. But I need you to hear me say this morning that what we're doing here, some of it, is for you. We want to grow. We want to help you grow. We want, to, we want you to understand more and more about who you are in Jesus. Some of that is for you to help you. But, but the majority of what we're doing in here is not for you. It is for him. We're here to glorify and worship him together the way that he has called and created us to do. It's not just for us. We've got to shift our perspective a little bit. 
Sundays are, are a moment for us to come together as the family of God to declare the praises of Him who's called us out of darkness and into His marvelous light. We were in darkness, now we are in light. So we need to sing His praises with everything that we have. I believe that we should worship God just for who He is. Just for who He is. Like it's the proper response, this kind of worship. Have you ever been around somebody who's important or famous and noticed the way people act? People treat famous people or important people differently. When I was in the Coast Guard, I, um, I, we, we had an admiral visit our unit one time. And this guy was a big deal. He was, he was in charge of all the Coast Guard on the West Coast. Everybody knew his name. He was in line to be the next commandant of the Coast Guard. We all knew he was going to get the job. And so he came to tour our unit, and they made me the golf cart driver. Can you imagine? Me. And they told me very specifically, you are not to talk to him. You are the golf cart driver. The officer who is sitting next to him is the tour guide. And I said, no problem, I got this. And so I drove this guy around, and here's what I noticed. Every single room that he entered was different because he was there. People treated him very differently. Guys that I had never seen work in three years of being at this unit suddenly had wrenches and and manuals and were doing things when he walked in. Everybody stood up a little bit straighter. Everything he said was hilarious, you know. He, he made this joke in front of the whole unit. And if I'm being honest, it was a terrible joke. Not funny at all. But we could all tell that he wanted it to be funny. And everybody said, <laughs> Admiral, you are so funny. Thank you for being so funny. And, and these are the same guys who never laughed at any of my jokes, which I know for a fact are funny. We treat people differently just because of who they are. And we can do this with people that we think are important, but sometimes we forget that God is God. Great is the Lord and worthy to be praised. I I believe that we should be worshiping him as a response simply because of who he is. He doesn't have to earn it. He doesn't have to, to do something special for us to respond in worship. We should be worshiping him because he exists, because he is God, because he is the creator of all things, and his actual existence demands our praise and our worship for who he is. Psalm 145, 3, great is the Lord and worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Psalm 48 says, great is the Lord and worthy to be praised. Psalm 95 says, great is the Lord and worthy to be praised. It's almost like the psalmist wanted us to see a theme throughout the whole of his works. That God is great and because he is great and because he is God, he is worthy of our praise for who he is. If we really believe that this is the God who spoke the universe into existence, how else can we respond than to worship him with everything that we have? Moses once begged God to show him a glimpse of who he is. You see, Moses would speak to God face to face like a friend, the Bible says, but Most scholars believe that the version that Moses would speak to was a subdued version, maybe even a pre-incarnated, pre-incarnate version of Jesus. And he would walk out of those meeting places with this subdued version of God, and his face would be shining with the glory of God so much that he would have to veil it. But it came to be where that wasn't enough. He needed more. So he just said to God, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And God said, if you were to see all of my glory, you would die. You couldn't handle it. So I'll give you a glimpse, just give you a little glimpse of who I really am, and I will pass by, and as I pass by, I'm going to declare who I am. And it says, the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, Yahweh. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God. Don't you love that the very first word that God would use to describe himself is compassionate. Most of us, if I were to ask you to describe God, to give me some character traits, we'd kind of start in the omnis, omnipotent, omniscient. We, you know, he's all powerful. He's all knowing. That's not how God would describe himself. He said, I'm a compassionate and gracious God, slow 
to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Maintaining love to thousands. Moses, in verse 8, he's hearing God declare who he is. Just who he is. And look at verse 8. It's the only response he can give. It says, Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. It's the right response to who God is. It's just to get, get, get in front of him and give him everything that we have to offer in worship. For who he is. And we worship the way we do for what he's done. Who he is is enough. What he's done kicks it up a notch. I don't know. I don't know what he's done for you. But I know what he's done for me. I was 19 years old and I was lost in every sense of the word. I didn't know who I was. I couldn't see a good future for my life. I didn't have drive or purpose or meaning. I was angry. And so I joined the United States Coast Guard believing it would give me purpose. It did not. As time went on, I felt hope dying inside of me. I was so mad at the world. I was bitter at the church for not being exactly what I wanted it to be. I was mean to the people in my life. I pushed people away constantly to make myself more and more secluded. And when I was 21 years old, I tried to take my own life. And it was just a few weeks later that I discovered the life-changing truth of his goodness and grace. I read the words that say, I am, I am Yahweh. Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God. I, thought, I remember for the first time I read it, thinking, that's interesting, that this God I would have described as angry and kind of vindictive, describes himself as compassionate and gracious and slow to anger. And, and as I read his scriptures more and more and understood his character, it drew me to worship. A few weeks after I read that, I read in Matthew the story, uh, or in Luke, the story of a son who had squandered his family's fortune, who had dishonored and, and shamed his father and the name of his family. And upon running out of everything, he came home, just hoping to be a servant in his father's household. But the father sees him coming over the crest of a hill, and he drops everything, and he runs to him, and he wraps him up and puts his arms around him, and he puts his ring on his finger. He dismisses his excuses. He doesn't want to hear his reasons why. He just says, get the calf and kill it. We're having a party tonight. My son is home. And I remember just a few days later reading about how Jesus would go to the cross and how he would do it for me, just so that I would have a family to belong to, so that I could be a part of what God would do for the rest of eternity. And I gave my life to him 100% completely, everything that I am. In that moment, I just, he just absolutely rescued me. And, and I found freedom. I mean, real freedom, freedom from depression, Free, freedom from when I would close my eyes at night, wishing I wouldn't wake up the next day. Depression. Freedom from can't get out of bed, don't want to do anything, don't want to see anybody. Depression. Freedom. Freedom. Freedom from addictions that I thought I would struggle with the rest of my life. Freedom. I was a prisoner. You got to understand. I was in a cage. I could see it. I could feel it closing in around me. And now I am free. He has freed me. I am changed. I will never be the same again because of what he has done in my life. And he didn't just free me. He put a purpose in front of me. He said, I've called you to this. I put this in you. I see something for you. And he's set me now on a path where I get to make a difference for him for the rest of my life. I've never felt more satisfied, more full. I have meaning. I have peace. I have hope for a future. And that's what he's done for me. And how could I respond any other way than to bow down to the ground and worship him with everything that I am for the rest of my life and all of eternity after? I'm just telling you,
I love this passage in Luke 19. This is the message. It's a paraphrase, but I like the language. It says, the whole crowd of disciples burst into enthusiastic praise over all the mighty works that they had witnessed. They just began to praise who he is for what they had seen him do. And some church people came around and they said, teacher, get your disciples under control. And Jesus said, if they were to keep quiet, the rocks would cry out. Don't let the rocks take your place. Respond to what he's done for you. Respond to who he is. The only way that we should in worship and in praise. I love that worship is the right response to what God does through scripture. In Exodus 15, Moses is leading the Israelites out of 400 years of slavery and into a new life of freedom. And they cross the Red Sea on dry ground and God closes the waters on their pursuers, reminding them that this is a real freedom. It's one that sticks. You don't go back into captivity. I'm releasing you to freedom. And, and their response is to sing a song of worship. Moses' song in Exodus 15 is repeated in Revelation 15. At the end of days, it's sung again. And I just love it because Moses is leading the men in this song, and it says his wife Miriam is leading all the women in a chorus. And this is more than a million people just singing God's praises for what he had done for them and the way he had rescued and freed them. It is our right response is to worship him for what he's done. We respond to God in worship. You need more of this in your life. It can't just be Sunday morning. It, it, can't, it can't just be a, a song you listen to that you don't engage with while you're driving in your car. It's got to be more. God needs more. He's, he's requiring more of us. He deserves more of us. We need to respond to him in worship because worship changes everything. I believe worship for me, in the last year, I need you to know that worship has changed everything. That I am different. I'm shifted and changed because I'm aligned with the reason I was made. To worship him. Worship changes everything. I need you to be able to experience this. And this is the best advice I can give you for whatever season you are in right now. If you're in the middle of your worst, hardest, darkest season the first thing you need to do is worship. If life feels hopeless, you need to worship. If you're struggling, hoping, asking God for a breakthrough, you need to worship. Worship changes everything. Worship changes everything. It shifts your perspective. If, you've, if you're in a season, you, you just haven't felt the presence of God. And maybe ever, you're wondering, you know, I mean, I've been through the ritual, I've done the practice, I've, I don't know, I've been to church, I just, I don't know that I've ever really felt his presence. You need to worship, worship, worship. If you're in a season where you feel absolutely powerless, I need you to know that worship changes everything. God's presence is attracted to worship. Psalms 18.3 says, I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise and he saved me from my enemies. He's attracted to our worship. He draws near to it. His presence comes close to it. It says his, his presence inhabits the praises of his people. When you worship in a season where you feel powerless, there is no greater power than the presence of God. There is nothing that is more powerful. This is the same presence. This is the same God, the same spirit that cast the stars into the sky. That would, would have the power to speak to a dead body and say, come out. And the body listens and gets up and gets out of the grave. If you feel powerless right now, you need the presence of God in your life. Because in his presence, there is power. And worship attracts his presence. You need his presence. Worship changes everything. If I get bad news, if, if I feel overwhelmed, I, sometimes I just feel overwhelmed. It all feels too heavy. The weight of it feels like it's too much. Or, you know, you get that phone call. You ever get that phone call? In one minute, everything's different. This life's shifted. It's changed. It'll never, you'll, never, you'll never see the world the same way again. You get that phone call. The news breaks. 
it is our, our human instinct in those seasons to withdraw, to, to move away from God, to move away from people. And that is the devil moving you from the only thing that you need. All I need is just a few minutes of worship. This has become my practice. I get off the phone. Just give me a minute. Everybody, just give me a minute. Give me, give me 10 minutes. Let me put on my favorite playlist and just let, let me just worship him with all of my heart, God. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. You, what a powerful name it is. Just give me a minute, you know? Just give me, I can feel it right now. I, I can feel it. It shifts your perspective. You start off and just your, your problems are big and your God is small and you just give a few minutes in his presence and it just, the, your perspective shifts. All of a sudden, your God is big again and your problems are small. Worship changes everything. John 4, 23, but the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him in that way. He's looking. He's looking. He's searching for people who will worship him in spirit and truth. He desires it. He seeks it. He's attracted to it. His presence draws near to it. You need the presence of God now more than ever. In this season more than ever, attract his presence with your worship, with your praise in spirit and in truth. Here's how we do it this morning. A few different, just a couple, and then we're done. How, how we worship. This is, this, this is important. Worship based on choice and not on feeling. Worship based on choice. You get a choice. You choose. You choose. You choose. See, I don't know how many of us, how many times I'm guilty of this. You, you say, you know what, I'm just not feeling it today. I just don't really feel, you know, I'm, I'm so tired and this season has been so stressful and hard. I don't feel like waking up early to worship. I don't feel like that. I'm, I don't know. I'm not feeling it in church today. You know, I think I'm going to show up 10 minutes late, just kind of kind of slip in, slip out. I don't really, I'm not feeling like engaging in worship today. I, don't, I just don't feel like it. I don't feel, I don't know. You know, I, life's tough right now. I don't know that I feel like praising God. I feel, I don't know. I just think, I think right now, I just feel like a little bit removed from his presence. I don't, I don't feel him. And so I don't know that I need to go worship him. I need you to hear me say that it's a choice. See, I believe choice is from God. I think the choice honors God above all other things. I think choice, the way that God feels about choice is evident by the placement of the tree in the Garden of Eden. See, he desires us to choose him above all other things. And the enemy wants you to believe that if you don't feel it, if you're not getting the emotional connection, you're not driven there emotionally, if your heart doesn't say go worship, the enemy wants you to believe that you can't engage in worship. And so if you're not feeling it, then you just should pull away from it. You know, you're in a hard season. I don't feel like being in life group right now. I don't feel like being in church right now. That is the enemy's greatest strategy to isolate you. Do you know how every predator works? Because the Bible calls the devil a lion. And, and, and every predator, what they do is they find a community group and they get someone and they isolate them from the rest of the pack so they can kill them. He wants to isolate you. God wants you to choose him. Habakkuk had a hard job. He was a prophet, and uh, he, he, he asked God for some good news for the people of God. And God said, well, I've got some great news for you. I am going to conquer Israel with the Babylonians. You're going to be exiled. We're going to destroy everything. And Habakkuk's like, well, great. Thanks, God. Do, can I keep that for me, or do I have to share that with other people? And he writes this in chapter 3. Though the fig, the fig tree does not bud, and there's no grapes on the vines. Even though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there, there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will be joyful in God my Savior. That yet indicates a choice. Choose to worship Him. Make it a choice. Choose. Say, I'm going, to get, I'm going to get there early to Sunday, and I'm going to make the choice to go all in, to give everything I have in worship. I don't feel like it, 
But here's what will happen. You make the choice. You get up early. You're not a morning person. I know. I'm not a mo- The people around you know not to talk to you until after 9 a.m. I believe worship could change that for you. I make the choice to wake up early to worship the Lord my God. And what happens is it starts out with, I don't feel it, it's a choice, and something shifts and changes. His presence is attracted to your worship. You enter into the presence of God, you worship him, and you walk out of that space different. Worship based on choice and not feeling. And worship with everything I have. This is, this is kind of, this is the main idea. When we worship, we need to worship with everything we've got. You can't call it in. It's, worship isn't something that you do a little bit or, or that you try. Worship is a choice that you go all in on. Worship. I think it's time to take the way that we worship up a notch. I think it's time for us to learn to worship without worrying about how we might look or sound or the way people might look at us, if we're doing it in public, how how it might appear to the people around us. I think worship should require sacrifice. I think it should require us to get a little uncomfortable. There's a great story about King David in 2 Samuel. He's just won this great battle, and he wants to give God the glory for it. And so he wants to go worship him, so he goes to this man's land, and he says, we're going to build an altar here, and I'd I'd like a cow from your flock. We want to sacrifice it to God, and and give a burnt offering to honor him. And the man says, you're the king. Whatever you want, it's yours. Everything I have is literally yours. You're the king. Just take it. Whatever you see, take it. You know, it's, it, you're the king. And David looks at the guy and says, no. I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. Our worship should require something of us. And we, we don't have to bring... We don't have to bring him our our burnt offerings anymore. That's done. Those times are done. We bring him a sacrifice of praise. I think it should cost you something. If you're not a morning person, maybe it's going to cost you your mornings a little bit. And when you get in there to worship on your own, I do, I, I mean, I'll do this in my office, and my, our walls are real thin, and I get real nervous that, the, that our administrative team is going to be out there trying to do, like, computer work, and they're going to hear me off-key, just tear up, just embarrassing myself, or somebody's going to open that door, and oh, my gosh. I, 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 we had a basement in our, in our last house. I would go down to the basement in the morning, try to worship when no, nobody hear me, Lord, please. I would just get so nervous. I come, I come in on Sunday mornings, and I, I I, you know, just try to try to keep it as subdued as possible. Let's just let's not be a, a scene here. Let's not let's not get let's not get weird. But I think God wants us to get a little weird sometimes. You got to worship Him in a way that's uncomfortable because He's worthy of your worship for who He is, for what He's done. I think you need to put everything that you have on the line. Now, listen to me. Now, I don't mean put on a show. I don't, I, listen, this is, don't bring your tambourines and your shofars, okay? Don't come in here with a flag and start waving it around. That's not what I, I don't mean that. And so, you know, it's not actually that kind of fun sometimes. You wanted to try it, we'll try it. We'll see what, we'll, we'll give you some feedback later. But here's the thing. I don't mean put on a show. I just, I just mean worship in a way that is genuine for you. That is worship. That is worship. Sing it out loud. You know, if you got that, that voice, you know, that, that could kill a thousand flowers and, and you're used to just lip syncing your way through the song, you know, and you just, and that's, and you're doing it for all the people around you. It's not even for you. It's time to let those pipes go, you know. The Bible says, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Sometimes you just make a noise, you know, it might not sound joyful to the people next to you, but it'll sound joyful to God. Give Him your praise. Give him your praise. Give him your praise in a way that just comes from deep down inside you. Mark 12, 30, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. All. Give him everything you've got in worship. Make it a, just, I just dare you. I dare you. Make it a part of every day. Make it a part of every day of your life. I just, I believe, I know. I'm I'm just telling you. There's just nothing else you can do right now that you can go out and do today, that you can do tomorrow morning that's going to have a quicker and deeper impact on your life. 
there is nothing. Worship your creator. My practice now is to pray after I worship. It's just amazing the way that it's changed the way that I pray because my prayer comes out of a place of worship. See, I just found that before, for 10 years, my prayer came out of a place of want. I'm, I mean, just here's what I want, God. Here's what I want for people. Here's what I want for me. Here's what I want for the church. It's different now. I mean, I still tell God what I want. The Bible says to. But it comes out of a place of worship. See, when I go straight from a place of worship into a place of prayer, it's just, this will change you. It will change you. Make it a part of every single day. And on Sunday mornings, listen, I'm coming after you guys watching online right now. Listen, online is a great resource. It's, it's a tool. If you've never been here, it's a good way to see who we are before you come. If you're out of town traveling, it's a great way to connect with your family. Online church is not church. Church is when we come together as the body of Christ and we worship him collectively in one spirit, in one power, and come into this place, and I'm just challenging you to take it up a notch. If, you, if all you've got has been the Baptist step, try the early hand raise. Give it, nobody's gonna see. Give it one of these guys. If you've been here, take, take it up to I, I surrender. Give it the ice, you know, give it the halfway, maybe one arm, give, just, just take it up a notch. Dance a little bit if you have to. Ain't nobody, it's dark in here. Nobody's, nobody cares. Worship him because of what he's done for you. Because of who he is. Last thing. Here it is, guys. Just worship expecting God to respond. And he will. If you just believe it, you come into it, you get in his presence and say, God, I know you're here. And, and I, know, I know what your word says. Psalm 22, 3. He inhabits the praise of his people. Could there be a better promise in scripture? I mean, if you're just going to memorize one promise, he inhabits the praise of his people. The same God who spoke the universe into existence. He just, he's here. When we worship, he's here. It says in James 5, 8, come close to God and God will come close to you. I don't know how many people come in my office and, and say, Pastor, you know, I just need help. I, I don't feel the presence of God in my life. I, I'm trying, but I don't feel like he's there. I, I want to know. I want to feel it. I want to know he's close to me. Okay, we can fix this. Because when you come close to God, God will come close to you. He inhabits the praises of his people. Worship him every day. Give it everything you've got. You will experience his presence in a fresh way, in a new way. He will speak to you in ways that you've never, you've never felt before. You'll know he's there when you need him the most. Expect him to show up. And he, he does every time. You need his presence more than you know you do. If it feels like life's great and everything's good, you need his presence. If things are not okay, no matter how much you pretend they're okay, stop pretending they're okay and worship the only one who can get you there again. Everybody, everybody worships something because we're made to worship. Everybody gives their time, their attention, their focus to one thing above others. Make it God in song, in praise, in everything. Worship him and you will leave changed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we worship you, God. We come before you because of who you are, God. We declare you are a compassionate and gracious God. You're worthy to be praised. You're worthy of every ounce of energy we have, God. You're worthy of our praises. You're worthy of our sacrifices. God, you are greater than any, any other father. You, you've done so much for us, God. We praise you for the freedom you've given us. Lord, that you would come down here to this earth, to this place, so that we could be free forever. God, we just worship you. Father, we want to worship you more. We want to give you more, Lord. Lead us in this journey. Father, our praises are yours. Send us your presence, God. 
We declare your promises over this place that, God, you inhabit the praise of your people. Let your spirit sit heavy in this room today. We worship you. We need a breakthrough. We need a change. We need a move, God. And so we'll start with worship. We'll honor you. We'll make the choice, Father. We believe that you can do it. We believe that you've done it. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.